It's the Poker News Podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 837th episode of the Poker News Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Holloway, joined at Level 9 Studio in Las Vegas by Johnny Moreno, Johnny Vibes, and our Poker News Ontario ambassador and Twitch streamer extraordinaire, Kyle Anderson. Gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Obviously, love to do it. We got a hot topic, men the master win. Let me start by saying this. I honestly feel that there's nobody in the poker world who knows Men the Master probably better than I do because in 2018, I spent two weeks in Vietnam with men in a kind of embedded reporter situation. I got to know him. I wrote a five-part article series on him, which is on Poker News. We're going to get into that, but I want to talk about this situation first. So it happened in the Gladiators of Poker, right? This is a huge tournament down to, I think, 28 people, and it's deep on day two, the $300 buy-in tournament, over 20,000 entries, and so it's very deep. And there was a big hand in level 36 where uh, a gentleman by the name of Brian Smith moves all in under the gun. He's super short for like $4 million when the blinds are, let me see, I have right here, oh, a million, five million million. So he moves all in without even looking for $4.5 million. Steve Foudy calls uh, holding, I'm sorry, he three bet to $10 million with Ace King suited and then men the master four bet all in for $25 million with Ace King of Diamonds. Full, you know, Foudy calls. So we have a three-way all in. Long story short is Smith rivers a five. So he's going to win the small side pot and you have Foudy and men, the master chopping the bigger, uh, the bigger side pot. And, um, then Foudy, uh, Smith is out celebrating. We, we've seen this, right? We've got video and I'm going to show it here in a minute. Um, before we do like there was a shorted pot, right? I'm probably not describing this too well. There's a shorted pot. Uh, Smith didn't get as much as he should have, and men win, as he often is, is is caught up in the debacle. What did you guys see or hear, you know, on social media when this went down? Uh, first of all, I just want to say him celebrating and running off to the side like this is what we want to see at the WSOP. This guy obviously has never, to my knowledge, gone this far on a, such a on a, such a big stage. So you love to see it. You love to see him high fiving his buddies, you know, doing the woohoo and all that stuff. So. Anybody that's blaming him for not paying attention, not keeping a close watch on the dealer, not making sure that he got the right, the right amount of chips in game, it's hard to fault him for that because, you know, this is a big moment for him. So definitely no judgment on that part. Yeah. What did you see, uh, Kyle, when this was all going down? I am I going to going to echo Johnny here. The energy the guy had was just, it's its such an intense spot. The guy's running so deep. I think there was like 20,000 people in the field and mm -hmm. everything. So kind of the same. I can't blame him for not keeping an eye on the stack and everything. It's just, it's something that happens every hand of poker. You know, the dealer takes care of it and everything. And there was definitely... It was interesting to see how it went down and everything. Obviously, he pulls the stack back and everything. And, you know, things kind of take a turn from there, but we cannot fault the guy for obviously having a lot of powerful emotion during it. It's such a big spot and it was fun to see and also heartbreaking to know what the result came of that and yeah. everything. And when, well, when, when you think about it, think about as people that are professionals, as people that play a lot of poker, when we're in the small blind and we have an oversized chip and we sometimes we'll even forget ourselves like, oh wait, did I get changed for that hand? Like even as people that play a lot, Things get missed. And when you're talking about chip denominations in the millions, I can see how it would be so easy to just not really catch it in the moment until hand later. Well, let's show what happened because Brian Smith had some friends on the rail who were actually filming. So you're going to get to see the celebration that we talked about. Uh, you know what the hands, you might not be able to see the hands in the video, but you know what they are from our discussion. Uh, and then watch carefully. So there's three videos. We're going to run them back to back to back. The first video is the result of the hand, the celebration. The second video, if you look closely, you're going to see men win, uh, pull back some chips Keep that in mind because we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then the third video was, remember, this was 28 players left. Uh, they were about to do a redraw. And the redraw happened immediately after this hand. Uh, and this was uh, a reaction to that. You know, the, the Brian Smith noticed at this point involved the floor. Um, but here, take a look. Come on, baby! I knew it was Ace King, Ace King. Here it goes, Jack Five, right here. Five. 
Oh. Back door. Back door. Three. Jackpot. Let's go, man! Wow. Let's go! Bingo. What do you got to say to the people, bro? Bingo, bango. <laughs> Toby, cocktail table, 92! <laughs> Can you help her count this, please? I think you're off by 100,000. There you go, 45,000. Mac, I didn't even swear. With the lady. Let's go. I got the five. I knew that five was coming, boys. <laughs> It was coming the whole way. Let's go. 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 let us go and he's sitting here saying he watched. It's like, are you kidding me? You got you got They have it on video. All right, so there you have it. Thanks. Those videos were from Austin Lake and Taylor Shepard. Uh, thank you for sharing those with us. It really gives more of a, 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 vis a visual of what actually transpired. A lot of people have been harping on men pulling back those chips, right? I say I, this is what I would say to that is in a three-way all-in, you're all-in, short stack, under the gun, you three-bet, I take all my chips, move them forward, I'm moving all-in, and you call, we chop at the end, right? You win. We. I don't want my chips to get mixed up with yours, so I'm likely to pull my chips back too. I don't see that as like a damning evidence per se. You know, that's something I probably would do, I think is reasonable. And we actually don't know from the video, but we assume that, um, you know, when the dealer was counting out the chips that they didn't take it from men's stack, which is likely what occurred. But I don't know. A lot of people are harping that men taking those chips back is like a, all the evidence they need to convict them for a death sentence. No, on its face, taking your chips back and counting them out for the dealer request, you know, dealer's going to say you owe X amount. You count them out, give them to the dealer, dealer verifies. This is standard procedure in so many cases. So on its face, seeing him pull his chips back isn't quite the damning evidence. The thing is, is that when you're involved in these all-in situations, you know how many chips you're losing. So the only person that's really going to know if they paid a, approximately the right amount would be the people involved in the hand. Uh, the, the guy who was all-in, he knows that he did not get the right amount of chips. The other guy, he knows that he paid the right amount of chips. I think that men deep down probably knew that he did not pay the right amount of chips. And it's unfortunate because I think that a lot of people in our industry are good people. And I know for a fact, if they felt like they didn't pay the right amount, they wouldn't let it go because that like that karma piece of like, I didn't pay the right amount. You, you feel it deep inside, and you know, this is going to catch me later. If I don't stop this in the moment and pay the right amount, this is going to follow me for the rest of my life. But I don't know if men has that. I don't know if he has that deep inside to say, I didn't pay the right amount. I think perhaps, allegedly, he probably thinks, let me get away with this one. Maybe nobody will notice. It's definitely, I agree with you, Chad, in terms of it's an innocent act that I would probably do the same thing in this situation. It's a three-way all-in. You're going to chop it with the bigger stack. They have the smaller stack and everything. It's tough when it's somebody who has a history of doing stuff like that. It's an innocent act that can be used in a bad light. And in this situation, it kind of was. And it probably, obviously can't speak in factual evidence, but in this situation, we only have the evidence that we have. And it is a big part of it. So I'm more of the side of it's an innocent act for sure. But if a guy has a history of doing these things, then we kind of have to use the evidence at face value and kind of echoing on what Johnny said. The guy who's short stack definitely knows how much he's owed. The other guy seems very confident in, yep, this is how much we paid. And we have incomplete information, incomplete amount of chips, and we just kind of have to use the information that's in front of us.
I'm going to say this about the hand as a whole. To me, the primary responsibility in the story of this hand, if you will, is, is dealer error, right? The dealer has the responsibility to make sure that pot is there. You can see in the video, there was a floor person there as well, because deep in tournaments, they often verify these all in situations. So there was two layers there that ultimately failed, right? And then it gets to the other, you know, the player responsibilities, which I don't disagree with you, Johnny, that there is a good chance that men just sat back and let's see what happens. You know, if they don't ask, I'm not going to just throw it in. But I also know men very well, as I said, and from what I've heard, I can't say this is true, but he certainly has a history of doing this. He likes to drink when he plays. And I had heard he had been drinking in this tournament, which makes sense. They started early in the day. This is very late in the day. Um, and I remember in 2018 when men win went deep at the WPT Gardens. And there was a, a hand up with, I believe, Steve Sung, where it was, he went to put in some chips. He said he didn't put in the chips. It was very angly. He caught a lot of uh, dew heat in that one. And it was a month or two later when I did this uh, embedded reporter with him in Vietnam, and I asked him about this hand, and he legitimately did not know what I was talking about. He had no clue, and he's like, no, no, no that doesn't sound, that never happened. And I'm like, man, I pulled up the hand history, and like, it, it happened, and he looked at it, and I honestly believe from his reactions, like, he just didn't know. His, you know, his head just wasn't working that way. You know, he's almost 70 years old at this point as well. I'm not trying to make excuses. I know I'm going to get a lot of flack on this, this show because it's going to sound like I'm def uh, defending men um, when I'm certainly not. I just think that all these calls from this hand, this instance, saying that you know, he should be banned and he's cheating uh, is, you know, he's – getting railroaded a little bit, right? We don't know the intention. Um, it could have been, like you said, maybe he did know and he was shooting this angle. But the possibility also exists that he was just drunk and, you know, oblivious to it. And, you know, that's not necessarily an excuse, but that doesn't absolve the dealer in the floor in this situation either. So um, something else about men that is interesting. I saw it all over social media. I heard you just say it on this show. You know, men has a history of such things. WPT Gardens, all right, there was an example but yeah, you know, I've heard angles, right? There's no denying he shot some angles. Is that cheating? Sure, if some people consider that. But more egregious, people are saying such things as, you know, let me ask you this. What do you, what do you think you know about men in the master win? So I've, I've heard stories, you know, being in the industry for over 15 years now, I've definitely heard stories. Even as someone that wasn't a tournament grinder, you would hear stories about how in the Southern California games they would – collect chips and take them away from the table, give them to men on breaks. Of course, like this can never be proven and this was never caught in the moment, but it's weird that someone like myself would hear these things 15, 10 years ago about this, this person and never it really be public. It would just kind of talked about in smaller circles amongst people. So yeah, I've heard those things about him collecting chips from uh, other players. And, and I'm not going to say that that's truth. That's just what I've heard. Sure. Kyle, anything from you? My, I've only been able to read your articles the last couple of days and everything and just more of like, I guess, a human philosophy perspective that I have on it sometimes where there's, it's, it just happens to be a lot of coincidence that's happening. He's involved in these situations continuously. Are they his true intentions? Are they not his true intentions? The only thing we know for certain is that they keep happening. So, you know, we can only take the information with what it is, but the fact that these situations keep happening and in such a deep run, in such a deep spot that, you know, these chips, every single chip is so valuable and this situation happens. Yeah, I'm 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 of the camp that you can't really ban him or do do anything outrageous to bar him from playing on a situation that's uh pretty, you know, ambiguous. Like we we're not sure the, the verdict is out. Um, I will say that the culpability from the casinos is pretty consistent when it comes to player versus player. The casinos usually just like, eh, we're, we're not going to get involved in this one. You know, if you're in a cash game and somebody calls an all in and doesn't want to pay the all in, the casino is not going to step in and make them pay the all in. By the way, don't do this at home. You can actually leave with your chips or you can leave and not pay the all in. You'll be banned from that casino. Right. But these are things that like the casino just doesn't want to get involved in player on player chip discrepancies, things like this. But I'll tell you one thing, if a player messes with the casino, they have no problem 
with the culpability there and banning a player. So it's it's men perhaps angling or taking advantage of another player. So we're probably not going to see the casino step in. But I guarantee you if men mess with the casino, there would be some issues. Let me tell you what I learned about Men the Master when I did this. Uh, if, if you want to check it out, it's on PokerNews.com. Search Men Win or search the, the title. of It's a five-part series is Master of One. So when I did this uh, embedded reporter assignment, it wasn't really an assignment. It was an opportunity. I took it. And I told them, like, look, I'm not here to write a fluff piece. I am here to tell the story as I see it. And so I went in there open-minded. I had heard the same stories that you had, and I wanted to prove them true if I could or dispel them if if I could there too. So, And I spent a lot of time, but granted, this was six years ago. There was a story. It's still out there. Scott Seaver referenced the story uh, in response to this situation. And it's you know, like an urban legend about men master, about uh, men the master at Foxwoods back in the mid to late 90s. He was caught in his room with a bunch of chips, right? And they banned him from, you know, kicked him off the property. So I wanted to know if that's true, because that's one of the more highly referenced uh, stories about Men the Master. And so I actually got in touch with Kathy Raymond, who was the director of poker operations at Foxwoods at the time. And she is, she is now a, a Women in Poker Hall of Fame, very well respected, worked at the Venetian for many years. And I actually reached out to her and she said, no, that's not what happened. In fact, what it was, was men had a guest in his room who was cooking fish Right. And it sounds strange, but once you spend some time with in Vietnam with men's friends, you kind of you kind of get it. Um, And it set off the fire alarms and men's name was on the hotel room. So they kicked him out. You're not supposed to be, uh, you know, and she said clearly that there was no um, no chips found in the room. She told me that in 2018. She said she had written an article in Card Player magazine shortly after it happened. So it's just one of those instances where it's like, all right, this is not quite the tale that we've been told. Um, And I tried to reach out, like, is there any instances of casinos who have banned him for cheating and things like that? And it was kind of, and again, I'm going to get flack for like, I'm defending him. Let me get to that point too. But as far as like cheating and being banned, nothing has ever been, never, you know, never existed. Men denies it. You know, in the interview, I asked him point blank, he denies that sort of thing. Um, But of course, of course he would, if, even if he was. There's zero doubt that men has been a habitual offender of being an a abuser of dealers, treating dealers like shit. That's happened for decades. He even admits to it. Um, I think he's calmed down some in, in his older age. There's no denying that he's drinking at the table and has antics there. Um, but as far as like, all, and there's no doubt that he angles, right? This could be an ex- uh, example that we're talking about. The one at WPT uh, Gardens was another example. But as far as the out and out cheating, like you said, it's going to be impossible to prove. Did it happen? Who knows? That's the thing. Everyone's assuming that it did. But I think there's just a misconception out there like, oh, he's been caught in the past. Like there's hard proof out there that he has in the past when really there isn't, you know, and and I tried to get some poker pros to speak publicly on the record about it. And nobody really would because it's all been hearsay, if you will. Again, not a defense of of men per se. I just like it when the the facts are straight. Right. And uh, I do think, you know, men certainly is guilty of, as I said, abusing dealers, drinking at the table. I wouldn't be surprised if there was like a stable where they're sharing chips or dumping chips and in that sort of thing back in the, in the nineties. Um, but in this particular interest, uh, Foxwood story, at least I was able to debunk that, yeah. uh, but people are still referencing it. This brings up something interesting that was going around a couple of years ago when, uh, there was some issues with people calling other people out for WSOP.com ghosting or, Um, you know, new accounts playing certain ways. And it came back to the casino was never going to reveal a quote unquote black book of people that they had banned. And there was a lot of people calling for transparency. So like you said, if when was, if men was perhaps banned from a casino, we would actually never know about it because there's no public registry. There's no database of these types of things. And it's unfortunate because, you know, if someone gets caught uh, if WSOP.com bans a player and they're a public person and they know everybody knows this person, WSOP.com doesn't have the it doesn't it doesn't need to, but as a community, we would love it if they would share these types of information because it can help us self-police the community, even if they're not willing to police it beyond a private ban. 
let me ask this. Does the line, is the line drawn just for poker infractions, right? So for instance, this was a 20,000 player field. I would guarantee you that some of the players in that field are, you know, maybe a convicted murderer somehow or a child molester or things like that. Like mm. we, I've reported on literal people who were accused of murder and in, in waiting trial before. From so, the casino's perspective, obviously they don't care about that right. sort of thing. But let's say that they were a cheat and the casino had caught them cheating. Do you think that the casino would let them play? Well, no, it's the same thing if you got 86 from Caesars for, you know, cheating in the pits or something, you know, they would... Yeah. Ban them from the from the casino, from the property. Yeah, so um, cheating in a casino is worse than convicted felons <laughs> in terms of, <laughs> and I, like, in terms not, of the casino. Yeah, and I'm think, not advocating you know? that that should be the case. You know, poker is one of the great things about poker is if you have the buy-in, you can come play, you know, minus uh, being barred for whatever mm -hmm. reason. And there's stupid reasons people get barred, right? There's been people who have been uh, not at the World Series of Poker, have been at a Caesars property in, I don't know, in uh, Indiana, got too drunk, security kicked them out of the casino. They're 86, and that means they're 86 from all Caesars and the WSOP. There's some well-known pros that that's happened to. Yeah, definitely. Not necessarily Indiana or, you know, drinking, but you get the point. There so. is there's a process for, uh, you know, getting reinstated. Obviously, those kind of infractions you can overcome. Uh but I, but like I said, it's if it's player on player violence, player on player cheating, the casino just doesn't really seem to care as much as player casino cheating. Right. Well, as for men, the master, as I said, I did the embedded reporting with him uh, back in two thousand six, uh, two thousand eighteen, and uh, you know through that experience, I got to know men. So when this happened, this incident happened at the World Series. Uh, I wanted to get his perspective and see if he even remembered it, unlike he did in the WPT Gardens hand. So I actually sat down with men uh, very briefly. Now, men's English isn't the best, uh, so keep that in mind. But uh, this is what he had to say about this entire incident. All right, men, the hand, the ace-king, ace-king, and the jack-five, it's causing quite the controversy. What do you recall about that hand and the, the, it apparently being a shorted pot? I don't think so because uh, I got... 25 million I'm going in, I think the dealer take the money, pay him, so uh, Ace King took the money back, I took my money back, but I don't know what happened, but anyways, I'm not intentional, took like million, like nothing with 25 million that I have, but something happened, the floor man asked us to pay a thousand, uh, a million dollar each, I'm not intentional to do anything, because I took my money back because of side part. If I'm, I believe that they already paid it back, or maybe it showed a, a thousand, a million. So each of us paid them a million. It's nothing wrong with that. I, I play thousand hands, so I don't know what's going on. But honest, I got twenty-five million, one million short. I, I don't know. I'm sorry if people think that I took the money. Back in, in intentionally is not okay. I'm minimized. So I'm sorry that what happened there, but. All right, let's talk about something a little more positive, and that is the two of you. Kyle, you are the Poker News Ambassador for Ontario, uh, but you're here in, at the WSOP. Tell us, though, what your responsibilities usually are outside of you know, being in Vegas. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. So. As a Poker News Ambassador in Ontario, we just got started with the whole ambassador thing. We're doing it in Ontario. So any sort of live poker news, any sort of online poker news, we're going to be compiling a monthly newsletter. We're going to be compiling information. And there's just so much interest in live poker in Ontario. We just had the WSOP happen. Pretty sure each event capped at around 300 people. You were able to sign up as an alternate I think every tournament doubled, essentially. There was 600, 700 people. There's just so much interest. So part of being an ambassador is just shining a light on poker in Ontario, the live version, the online version. You can catch me on Twitch. We're streaming mostly on global poker, but we're also doing some local Ontario sites such as PokerStars, GGWSOP, BetNGM, 88, just streaming a bunch of poker. And it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm very passionate about growing the game in a very fun, very social light. You know, we were one of the last people to sort of reopen from COVID and going back to live poker. I think we didn't even start till around 2022. And the interest is there. I love to see the poker rooms grow. There's so much interest in the game and just to be able to be a part of growing the game 
and the place I grew up is going to be a lot of fun. You are certainly entertaining on Twitch, and I got a little clip here I want to show the viewers. Let's take a look. No blinds. Still like no blinds, brother. Look at like no blinds, dude. All in. Good luck. Bold! Bold! It's probably an any two. Shit! Oh my god, all the outs. Is this too many? This is too many outs. This is too many outs. It's not too many outs. Let's go! Let's go! It's not too many outs. That was textbook too many outs as far as I'm concerned. That's lit. All right, so that's your, you know, that's a taste of what you yeah. do on Twitch. For those who want to follow along more, can, where can they do that? So you guys can follow me at twitch.tv slash Kyle Anderson Poker. I'm not claiming to be a poker pro. I'm just claiming to be the best poker player that I can be, create a fun environment, entertaining environment, going on a lot of deep runs. My game has taken quite the upswing the last year. It's been a very fun ride to be a part of, running well, playing well audience numbers have been great and everything so please give a follow please check out the stream it's been a lot of fun well, a lot of fun yesterday too because you got to rub elbows with 17 time world series of poker bracelet winner phil helmuth yes so as part of working in vegas for poker news uh i was tasked with getting some signatures for some items that are going to go back to the uk for some charity items and of course phil helmuth is one of the signatures they wanted they have an old school t-shirt i think it's from 89 of him at the world series of poker just his face and everything on the shirt so needed to get a couple signatures of that it was on break i had presented the shirts to him he kind of just nodded at me and everything he brought out his phone Pointed it at me. I'm like, are, are we taking a photo, Phil? Are we taking a video? And he's like, oh, you're on camera. I'm like, okay, awesome. And he's like, hello, Poker News. Hi, don't, Phil. Don't just tell it. I got the clip. We're going to oh, show it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Here it is. Hello, Poker News. Hello, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are at the break of the Potlum and Omaha tournament. And I'm signing t-shirts for Poker News. That's kind of a weird signature. I think it's a little better on that one. I really do, do love this shirt. It's it's actually, the photo was actually taken from the 1989 main event. I recognize it right away. Um, that looks like day three, uh, probably. Uh, these are $1,000 chips right here. And these are 500s. Um, anyway, we're doing it for Poker News giveaway, right? For charity, we're sending them to the UK, I believe, and they will be used as a charity prize. So we really appreciate it, Phil. Cool, man. Anything on the back of that shirt? Uh, oh, this one's one. just a generic WSOP one, okay. if you could. All right, so that, I mean, that is classic, Phil. You know, not and doesn't miss an opportunity to market himself. And yeah, uh, yeah I'm glad you got on camera with that one. Uh, Johnny, I ran into you yesterday. You were actually playing uh, right on uh, table next to your brother. And uh, I don't know how he did, but I mean, obviously, you're here with us. So yeah, we, uh, we both. Pretty much bubbled that tournament. Um, it was a fun time. But getting back to Phil Helmuth, I, I think that uh, anytime you have an interaction with Phil, it's going to be interesting. Good, <laughs> bad, yeah. in between. You know, I've over the years I've had my fair share of interactions with Phil. He's uh, he's berated my brother in a World Series of Poker tournament, and you know, I just always thought like, I want that to be me one day. You know, like I, I feel like it's just part of the bucket list. And uh, it's actually a video I made not too long ago was uh, playing a cash game with Phil. Uh, it was a big cash game. I think it was like a 50 hundred game. And I was like, my goal is to get berated by Phil Helmuth. And uh, I was on live at the bike back in the day and it did not work out. He beat me in a couple of pots. Um, but I ended up getting berated by him later on at Champions Casino. He had me uh, out for an event when they were opening that casino. And it was a fairly standard hand where um, I had ace queen and an ace high board and bet flop, bet turn all in river. And he had an ace with the worst kicker called down. And I got it. I got the <laughs> Phil Helmuth blow up. I got the berating. He stood up. He flicked his cards like this. He was like, calling me an idiot, saying that I'm going to like bluff it off and I don't know what I'm doing. And honestly, this was, you know, like a lot of people would be upset by this. But to me, it was a highlight. You know, it was something that I'll remember forever. And, uh, you know, while Phil obviously is the poker brat and he's a baby, um, he obviously just wants to win. And 
while my personality is nothing like this, you know, um, I still think it's fun to be on the other side of being berated by him. Poker News was actually at the World Series a couple of days ago and caught a Helmuth blow up almost exactly like you just described. I'm actually going to show that video right now. All right, so there you have it. Classic Phil Hellmuth. I once played with Hellmuth on Poker Night in America. Uh, it was a 25-50 game. I was taking a shot, and I beat him in a hand. And I could see the fuse was lit for the blow-up, but he caught himself because, you know, I was the lowly media guy at Poker News who has, you know, a, a media guy just taking a shot. And do you really want to berate the, the the media guy who's just taking a shot? So I think he caught himself. I saw I didn't get the full blow-up, but I could yeah. tell he he was not too We've happy. We've actually had some back and forth over the years. And at one point, I was blocked by Phil uh, just because I felt like I had uh, played with him enough and rubbed elbows with him enough that I could be honest about some feedback. And he didn't like what I had said. Uh, and then um, when I ended up accidentally donating a lot of money to KL Clayton <laughs> yeah. uh, for his van, I donated $10,000 because of retweets. Uh, Phil unblocked me to say that that was a great gesture. And Phil and I have made up since then. So, yeah, Phil's harmless. Um, definitely if you're a newer player, I can see how he his berating you could um, be a turnoff. But someone who has been around the game a long time, uh, it, it was more fun for me. I I, I hope that he does uh, clean it up a little bit for the newer players, but for us uh, grizzled veterans, let us have it. Uh, we talked about the men in the master win uh, hand, the debacle that that was, but there was actually a little other incident. Luckily, it has more of a happy ending, if you will, but you were there to experience it uh, like a missing stack coming back from break. What was that all about? Yeah, that was yesterday in the $2,500 freeze out. Um, I feel like there's always something with the World Series of Poker just going on. Um, and this actually speaks a little bit to how many dealers they need. And, you know, the win and all these other places, they, they steal a lot of the dealers. So... Uh, a lot of times they get newer, fresh dealers that aren't, you know, perhaps this person that's counting the men, the master pot is dealing their first WSOP. We don't know. And now they're doing calculations in the millions. Yeah, right, right. You know, like, so this is a case where a dealer, and I don't know much about this dealer, but last hand before break, uh, there was a pot and people left the table to go to their dinner break. And the dealer accidentally scooped in Adrian Mateos's chips into the pot, awarding the pot to the winner. And then when we came back from break, Adrian had no chips. Uh, I didn't see this firsthand. This is a couple tables over, so this is just what I heard. And they just had to they had to put us back on break for another 15, 20 minutes or so. We got to watch the end of the basketball game. And uh, they were like, Adrian Mateos has no chips. This, How can this be? It's Adrian Mateos. You know, obviously, <laughs> there's got to be an investigation. So, of course, uh, you know, I'm making a joke, but Adrian obviously is an amazing player. Uh, but yeah, they they looked at the cameras. They were able to figure it out. It's kind of crazy because all of the cameras that are installed, this is a temporary solution. You know, this is not some place that's set up 12 months out of the year. They're putting the cameras up uh, a couple weeks before, testing everything out. So if they do need to go look at one of these cameras, hopefully everything's working. It's not like a tried and true system, but luckily they were able to figure it out in this case and resume the tournament. Yeah, yeah. Uh as you said, the WSOP, I think doing the best job that they can given the circumstances, right? Huge turnouts in these fields. As you mentioned, there's great competition around town, the Win, the Venetian, Golden Nugget, Aria, all these places. So, I mean, a lot of dealers are needed. And so the, they do have to hire new dealers every year, just like we do at Pokernews. We have to hire new reporters every mm -hmm. year to to keep it replenished. And, and some are better than others and some just need experience. So I'm glad that they were able to resolve that situation because – um, that's the way it should be done. Stop the tournament for a little bit, get it figured out quickly, and uh, resolve it. They probably should have done that in the men the master uh, situation yeah. too. Yeah. I think that was one of the things that made it worse. They did the table redraw. They didn't uh, revisit it. I, actually, they, from what I understand, they did go back and take a million from the two people, Steve Foudy and, and men the master, and that was their 
resolution and then Smith busted a short time later. But, um, you know, we just want what's in the fairness of the game. I think everybody. Yeah. And I think that the community does a really good job of giving feedback uh, over on Twitter, over on X, where, you know, if people think that something's unfair and there's enough community outcry. Like I know that there was a lot of discussion over late registration and how people were gaming the system, quote unquote. And uh, the tournament directors are listening. Right. They're responding. They're like, how can we make this better? And uh, so n- while the wheels turn slow, sometimes at least they're listening. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about WSOP, some positive fun news. And that is the bracelet winners. Um, arguably the biggest one since we last uh, recorded an episode was Nick Schulman coming on on top in the 25K high roller for his fifth bracelet. It was a pretty dominating performance. He won a flip very early on. From there, had the chips to just really put his opponents to the test. He won it for $1.66 million. Um, at that final table, you had uh, David Stam, Ben Heath, uh, Sean Deeb in eighth place there. So a tough final table. And n- I mean, just Nick Schulman, is he uh, w- one of the greatest of all time? Is he one of the best all around players? Like people are saying this on social media. He's 39 years old. He's going to turn 40, I believe in September, meaning he's eligible for the Poker Hall of Fame next year. Should he get in? Is he a first ballot? Scott Siever, we had the same argument a couple episodes ago. He is 39. He's turning 40. Like, this is the backlog that is coming. But what are your guys' thoughts on Nick Schulman? Uh, Kyle, let's start with you. The fact that he's just able to compete consistently at such a high level, keep winning at these games in these just insanely tough fields, I don't know how there can't really be a conversation around it and everything. And the guy's got a part-time job as a commentator, too. He does great work as a commentator, and he's still crushing at the highest level against the toughest field. So i very happy to see him continuously winning, winning a bracelet. Seems like a great guy. And I just don't know how a conversation can't be around it at this point. So what exactly are the rules? Uh, One per year or is it? It used to be two, but the WSOP, I think three or four years ago, decided to go to one. They also switched it so that the only members who, uh, only people who voted were the living members, which uh, of which I believe there's 29 right now. Used to be us media members, certain media members got a vote. And I had a vote for several years, um, but they changed that all around. Really, I think coming back from the pandemic, I think it was in 2021 when they first started doing this. Um, and so the criteria really is um, 40 years old is the number one criteria. Um for a player, it's playing at the highest stakes, um, having the respect of your peers, and uh, being 40. I think that's essentially it. I don't know the off, right off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, just you mentioning Scott Siever and uh, Nick Schulman, you know, that's obviously going to be a tough decision if only one can go in. Uh, and that's just those two. There's still a long yeah. list of people who who deserve to be in and people who are still turning 40. Yeah, it's, it's because of the product of um, timing, you know, and the poker right. boom and where everybody was at. But yeah, I mean, Nick Schulman... The guy just is cool. I mean, you can just say one word about him. He's cool. And uh, he's one of those guys when you see him in the hallway, like I'm just forced to say, what's up, Nick? Because he's just like that kind of guy. And uh, elite, yes. Uh, It's cool to see him get a No Limit Hold'em bracelet. Um, It's also great to see that he he, he has a daughter now and he's shouting out like all the people that are important important to him. Uh, And when we talk about elite poker player, he's an elite commentator too. I don't know if there's anyone else that I'd rather listen to uh, on repeat, listen, playing a final table. You know, uh, I definitely want him doing color and probably I'd pick Ali doing um, the play by play. You know, I feel like that's our, that's the apex top of the food chain when it comes to commentary in the world series of poker. And whenever you try to do two things at once, whether it's play poker, stream at the same time, make YouTube videos, do podcasts, it's really hard to be elite at more than one thing. I am speaking for myself. I was never elite at any aspect of any of these things. That was always just pretty good. Nick is elite broadcaster, elite at multiple games of poker, elite at the Cadillac of poker, no limit hold'em, elite at cash games, elite at tournaments, Someone said he's elite at pool. I mean, what can't elite at taking photos? 
I mean, this guy is just unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, photo of the year for his winner's photo and when he won a bracelet last year. Uh, and then I did see on social media, like you were alluding to, like people saying he is Phil Ivy level when it comes to being all around player. Um, I, I think that this last this last bracelet actually puts him in like that Phil Ivy mystique of where someone that's not doesn't talk a lot, but lets the way that they carry themselves and their actions do the talking for them. Right. Phil Ivy, Nick Shulman. And uh, uh, there was even mainstream a little bit. Nick Wright uh, tweeted about this uh, victory. So a shout out there. Uh, Nick Schulman, a beast. Let me ask you guys, uh, just uh, who would you take? If you could only do one nom uh, one inductee next year for the Poker Hall of Fame, uh, just saying it was these two that you're considering. Of course, there's other deserving people. But if it had to come down to Nick Schulman and Scott Seaver, who would you choose? Let me give you a couple uh, stats here. I believe both are five-time bracelet winners now. Um, I want to double check that with Scott, but, uh, and Scott has 26 million in lifetime earnings and Nick has 20 million 50th on the all time money list. Scott is 30th in the all time money list. Um, both play mixed games, both play high stakes cash games. Um, both have a good reputation in the respect of their peers. This is like, honestly, this is like big slick versus small pocket pair. This is a, this is a coin flip, yeah. but Kyle, who, if you had to pick one, who would it be? I was going to ask, do you have a coin I could flip? <laughs> I could go either way on any given day, but I don't know this, the Nick Shulman conversation were just happy, like just ha had, just kind of points me in that direction. The hype and kind of like you said, Johnny's just like a cool guy. The photo, the winner's photo, I completely forgot about the winner's photo and everything. I think based off purely of the hype today, just us conversing and everything, I would have to go with Nick Shulman. Yeah, I I would also go with Nick Shulman. I think that when you talk about his elite uh, commentary and um, his ability to reach people and grow the game, I think that that just gives him the slight edge over Scott in that regard. Because if you do look at the resumes, Scott is equally deserving, if not more. Scott, a great guy, a great ambassador for the game. Um, so while we're taking Nick, number one, that does, that's no slight to Scott. He's obviously going to be there really soon. Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah, give me a coin essentially on this one. And I did verify it. they both have five bracelets now, uh, but the WSOP is not over and they're both playing grinding hard, both in the player of the year conversation. Uh, Nick has results dating back to 2005, Seaver right there at 2006. Uh, yeah, this is a, this is certainly a tough one. Here's the here's the resolution to the WSOP: induct more than one person per yeah, year. I think because of the the amount of people that got involved in the game in this this era of 2003, 2004, 2005 that are turning 40 now, uh, there's going to be a lot of deserving people that um, are going to make this one person per year rule feel a little restrictive uh, and leaving some people out that um, deserve to be in. But, you know, maybe that'll work itself out in 15 years or 20 years. So maybe maybe it's fine to keep it the same. I, in every sport, I'm always a purist. I never want them to change anything. So I want you to get your vote back. Give, give them the two again. I think that that'll, that'll work. Yeah, I think Negreanu had a great system where it was essentially two a year, two players, and then every third year, I believe, he is advocating for. Then uh, you give a third nominee, but that third nominee is an industry person, mm -hmm. right? So it's really hard for an industry person to get in. They could right now. You know, that's part of the criteria, and there are some that are in. But it's really hard right now. When players are the ones essentially voting, you know, they're going to vote for other players. So um, I think Negreanu has a great, great uh, theory on how it should work, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. This year, it is only one. Nominations are open right now. Um, but next year, Scott Seaver and Nick Shulman are going to be on that list. You can bet your bottom dollar. Uh, let's talk some other bracelet winners. Uh, we mentioned the gladiators of poker with the men win situation. Uh, he ended up busting, I believe, in 18th place right around there. Um, and then there was the final table. Steve Foudy, who was also involved in that hand, made the final table, finished in seventh place for $67,000. But in the end, it was Stephen Winters taking it down, turned $300 into $401,000. I mean, he had to go through 20,647 <laughs> players. Like, isn't that the dream? Like, Yeah. There was a tournament yesterday that concluded. I think it was the No Limit PLO. There was 3,300 people, $600 buy-in. I think a Canadian won it. I think his name is Alex something. I, forgot, I apologize for forgetting it. But they had gone down to the final three, and the guy's energy was just, he could not believe he was in this moment. They were... Stack or redoing the chips and everything, getting the stage set. And I talked to the guy a little bit. I'm just like, dude, this 
600 bucks into what is going to be 200 K. And he's just like, I'm like, how do you feel? He's like, dude, I was at the Flamingo. I was by the pool and I was like, oh, you know, I'll go, I'll go play this event and everything. And I'm like, well, what a heck, what a decision that you made at that time. You know, obviously with poker, every shuffle, every time you register, it's, you know, you kind of put yourself on a different path. The decision for him to go do that. He won a bracelet, won 200,000. Pretty sure it's his first bracelet, first cashed. The rail, he had so many people supporting him and everything. Just the poker dream, man. It's there. It's alive. The energy's there. People want to see good stories. People want to see the hype, be a part of it. It inspired me, and it was very cool to see. Yeah, I think you're referencing event number 30, the 600 mix, no yep. limit holding PLO, Alan Bakovic. Alan, yeah. Yeah, took that down for $207,000, so another huge payday. Interesting, uh, he ended up in a back-and-forth heads-up match, yep. whereas uh, the aforementioned Stephen Winter in the Gladiator, first hand of heads-up, and he gets it done. Efficient. Yeah, and I just love it. Two guys who, like, this is the dream. This is yep. what was sold to us in 2003 during the moneymaker boom, is anybody can come, turn a buy-in, compete with the best, and win big, and, and they certainly did uh, in those two events. Another winner was Daniel Vampen. Uh, he claimed his first bracelet in the 3,000 limit Hold'em 6 Max. I'm not going to lie. That just does not sound fun to me. <laughs> uh, uh, limit Hold'em. I've played Limit Hold'em tournaments before. But, uh, yeah, he takes that one down uh, for $148 thousand uh, dollars Roland Israel Israel short but Israel of Ishi. Um, I'm butchering that as I always do fifth for three hundred thirty three thousand dollars he recently crossed uh, the career mark for 500 over 500 WSOP related caches so WSOP caches here in Vegas and also on the circuit and I think that is a, a record and all-time lead so congratulations to him uh, Michael Christ wins the event number 27 1500 big O which I think is interesting I've played big O in a cash game setting but never in a tournament uh, he ends up winning that one for over three hundred thousand dollars so that was a nice turnout 1555 entries in that one did you play it big O I did not no, no. I've, I've actually really appreciated all the coverage that we've had uh, via live stream, uh, whether it's um, Poker Go, there's been some stuff on YouTube, um, and even th things are going on CBS. So, And I feel like there's been more options to catch a lot of these final tables in quote-unquote real time. So it's been it's been fun keeping tabs on that. The one that really caught my attention, I don't know if it's going to be on this week's or last week's, was the shootout. Is that one? That yeah, it was on already? last week, yeah. The yeah. Dan Sepio one. Yeah, it was just uh, the the style of play from the his opponent that got runner up was um, really wild, and it's just really fun to see guys play like that and be able to make it that far. And I, I think that the shootout is like the perfect format for that because there's not enough real time to do your homework on. Mm -hmm. You know, some guy all of a sudden is four handed and wins by playing crazy. He's got a new table the next day. Nobody knows anything about yeah. him. It's not like a tournament where you. It's hard to make it all the way from. 2,000 players to the final table without someone being like, that guy's been playing crazy the whole time. You get a new table, nobody knows anything yeah. about you, and he parlayed it into a second place. Really cool. Event number 28, $1,500, freeze out, no limit, hold them. 2,317 runners. That one was won by Evan Benton. He learned the game a year ago, and here he is winning a World wow. Series of Poker race at $412,000. So, wow. yeah, another huge, uh, huge score there. And I had hoped there is a event happening that is very exciting. I stayed up very late last night to see if a winner would be crowned because it would have probably dictated the main topic of this show. It's going to probably dictate the main topic of the next show. Uh, and that is the $10,000 limit deuce to seven triple draw championship event. It drew 149 runners. It's down to the final three. They played late into the evening and they had to stop. They're not coming back for another hour from when we're recording this. So we're not going to know who wins during this show, but it's Dan, down to Danny Wong, WSOP bracelet winner, down to Jason Mercier, just a legend, another Poke Hall of Famer who's probably getting close to 40, uh, and the legendary Phil Ivey going for bracelet number 11. There's something to be said. If it's Helmuth, Negranu, or Ivy making a final table, there's an electric atmosphere. Um, Ivy is the shortest of the three, 11 big bets, but it's very close. Danny Wong has 19 big bets. Jason Mercier, 15 big bets. So I don't know. I'm excited to leave the studio, go back over there, and see if Ivy can get this done. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I don't know a lot about the game, so... 
It's it's one of those things where I probably would not be watching this un- unless it was Mercier, Ivy, those kind of characters. They they're must see TV. And you're going to be on the rail, no doubt, like because you're doing some social media and content for Poker News, right? My eyes are going to be glued to this, just kind of like you said, Chad. Yesterday, the energy was totally different. A little different than what I used to play twenty cent, forty cent, eight game back in the day. So just hearing the strategy, overhearing just how different, of course, at such a high level the game is, and just to be a part of that and see the literal best in the business do it on the biggest stage at this game or in that game. It's it's a different energy. I'm very excited to see the conclusion of it. How about uh, Jason Mercier's new look? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's quite a difference. <laughs> he, he's, uh, he's, and we're going to end up flashing these pictures yeah, now that you see that. He's transformed a lot over the years from his baby faced uh, new kids on the block look, you know, to his grizzled, uh, huge beard, fisherman look to now his like uh, – surfing, uh, yeah, sleeveless tank top. Yeah. Yeah. He he put a lot of effort into getting slim and trim, if you Mm -hmm. will. Like, uh, and I admire that about him and, uh, he's a six time bracelet winner. So he's going for bracelet number seven. Um, as I said, he's going to be 40 here before too long. And if he wins number seven, he would become just the 10th player in history to win seven or more bracelets. Uh, John Hennigan, Went there this year, earlier this year. Uh, and so Jason Mercy has an opportunity to do that. Interestingly, Men Win, who we talked about a lot on this podcast, uh, also has seven bracelets. Um, but man, history knocking. And of course, if Phil Ivey can uh, win number 11, he will separate himself from Doyle Brunson, Johnny Chan, and Eric Seidel, who are, they're all currently tied with 10. So a lot of history there. And then Danny Wong. He's looking for his second and, you know, has the chip lead, looking to play spoiler in, in terms of the fans, mm-hmm. right? You know, fans are no doubt rooting for uh, Ivy or Mercier, um, but we'll see. It's going to be a good finish and we'll have more on that in the next episode. That's going to do it for the WSOP talk, but there was another event around town and that was over at the Aria, the Bet MGM uh, championship. It ended up having a huge turnout. Uh, let's see. It ended up getting a thousand. No, I'm sorry. 1,141, which broke the record of 1,026 from last year. Three point, almost $3.3 million prize pool. Did you go over for this one? I did not play it, but I was sweating yeah. down at the end because my brother was in the final 12 players or so. Brother's always down in the fine, <laughs> like it seems. Yeah. He's crazy good. Uh, Ethan Rampage Yao was there, finished in seventh place. Eric Baldwin, James Romero, uh, Shannon Shore, one of the crushers there. He ended up finishing runner up for $430,000 to Daniel Marr, who got the victory, the trophy, and $613 thousand dollars. Uh, we actually have the final hand from that tournament. Here it is. Another nice hand for Dan oh, on the Shannon button. Sizing. 1.15. <laughs> Shannon's an influencer. He is indeed. He's more also goes 1.15 and sure as ace queen. About 40 bigs. Four million, one hundred thousand. Three bet to four point one million. We're not going anywhere with the Queen Jack. On the button, 8.7 million already in this pot. Oh. And it comes Jack 10 8. More out flop, sure. Does have that two way straight draw. All in. And sure wow. jams. More asks for accounts. We could be playing for it all here. Not a 2x a pot jam. Yeah, I going to say two times the pot. 15. 
Top pair for Dan and a gut shot. Heads up. Makes the, the call. call. And here we go. Shore all in and behind. For now, needs an ace or a king to continue this match. Nine, of course, presents a chop. Moore just looking to hold on. Turn card brings another eight. Is it Moore's time? River card. Yeah, How's me. this for your wow. first live tournament win? Yeah, it's great playing with you. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Play great. <clears throat> Dan Moore is the Bet MGM Poker Champion. The winner of more than six hundred thirteen thousand dollars. All right, so there you have it. Congratulations to Daniel Marr taking that one down. Another success by the Bet MGM Poker Championship. Uh, let's talk twenty five k fantasy update. We we're tracking this at Poker News all summer long, and as we're recording this, it's a little shake up at the top. Team Dinkers had been on top, but Team Sternheimer has taken the lead. 517 points to 489 points for Team Dinkers. But as we mentioned, Mercier and Ivy are at this final table. Uh, David Coleman is chip leading a, another tournament final table right now. There's going to be a shakeup, uh, you know, come tomorrow. So check out pokernews.com. You're going to get to see all sorts of uh, updates, what sweats are happening. You can filter the chip counts in hands just for 25K fantasy players. Uh, here's a look at the top players as we're recording this uh, in terms of their value uh, and adding points, you can see Joao Perez on top with 134 points. And Nick Schulman, thanks to his victory, is the second highest earner for 130 points on team Daniel Negreanu. So lots of players there shaking it up. And then we also have the David ODB Baker League. A quick update on that. Poker News has a team. Not doing so hot. Really? I'm not going to lie. Um, yeah, we're doing pretty crappy. Do these players at the top mirror the WSOP POY? No, no, they don't. They're separate. So, Do you know who is in first for and, POY and right the now? And WSOP, let's see if I can. Player of the year. Because I'd imagine it'd be somebody like Nick Shulman or, or the It is Nick Shulman with wow. uh, 1,890 points. Sean Troyha uh, with 1,646 points. Scott Seaver with 1,605 points. So that is your current standings for the WSOP Player of the Year. Um, yeah, and uh, that'll be, that's going to be a tight one. That's yeah. going to be interesting. I uh, mean, if Scott and uh, Nick Shulman go one, two, or, you know, maybe that settles the debate. For I was just <laughs> thinking the same thing. Yeah, if either one of them can manage it, uh, I think that would be the difference maker. So, well, that is going to do it for all our talk. But before I let you guys go, what's coming up for you guys here? The World Series is a little over two weeks in, and uh, you guys, you know, feeling fatigued? You're still excited? What's up? Uh, I would say that I am feeling a little fatigued, mostly because it's been a really hot June. That's and, true. Uh, uh, even driving from my house to get to the World Series, the air conditioning in my car can't keep up with the with the sun that's beating in. So I'm already sweating before I walk in. You know, the tournaments uh, tournaments are really funny because I go in with pretty much no expectation, end up getting a, a fair amount of chips and getting towards the bubble, getting in the money. I'm like, wow, this actually might be the one. It's not the one, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so some, somehow, some way it's not the one. Um, but yeah, so I'm actually leaving the country to go to for, to a wedding, but I'll be back in about eight days. I, I feel like it'll be a nice reset to not be in the 110 degree heat. So yeah, feeling, uh, you know, as good as you can feel for not doing so great in tournaments, uh, having a nice reset. And uh, we'll be happy to gear up for the main event. I'm a big advocate for taking a little break, so mm -hmm. hopefully that will recharge you. And I know you're only here for a limited time, Kyle, but are uh, you enjoying it so far? I am buzzing, man. <laughs> I came here uh, on Monday, and just being a part of the WSOP, being on the floor, doing content creation and everything, seeing the tournaments take place, I cannot wait to come into work. I cannot wait for my off days to play tournaments. We have the $600 Poker News Deep Stack uh, championship coming up, I think, in a week or so. I'm going to be very excited to play that, hopefully run deep. and Bra Bracelet event, right? It is, yeah. Event. Yep. Really so cool. we'll be creating a lot of good content around there. But I'm buzzing with excitement, man. Very happy to be here. I'm here for a couple more weeks. 
maybe even longer. We'll see what happens, but the energy is high. I'm excited to play, excited to be here. It's been yeah. a very fun time. Well, this episode has been a very fun time. I appreciate you guys taking the time to join me. Remember, we're doing two episodes a week during the World Series of Poker. They are going to publish every Tuesday and Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. There's also an audio version that you can download at any podcast platform. Um, and we will be back on Monday. We will know who won, if it's Phil Ivey, if it's Wong, if it's Mercier. I have to wait and see. Until then, we'll keep a seat open for you.